respected chairperson uh, dr lotika dr vijay sagar thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction thank you uh, sanjay neeta archana and the whole team of uh, idec and uh, uh, i have a disclosure that this particular session is uh, uh, means nothing to disclose for this particular session hba1c in pregnancy and hy hyperglycemia in pregnancy i'll just try to be very brief i'll try to save two or three minutes of yours uh, as expected yeah i'll just yeah i am going to uh, cover this talk on small two or three slides on physiology of hemoglobin and hemoglobin a1c uh, what is the role of hb a1c in hyperglycemia and pregnancy do we have any clinical implications on those lines and the carry home message now let's go back to the physiology days of our first mbbs that we have uh, different types of hemoglobin we have hemoglobin a1 you have uh, uh, hemoglobin a a a2 hemoglobin a1 is around more than 90% after 6 month of age you have around 90% of your hemoglobin is uh, hemoglobin a and uh, it's if if you have low level of hemoglobin uh, a then it's it indicates any anemia or the blood loss a2 is around 1.5 to 3.5% of the total hemoglobin and may indicate thalassemia hemoglobin f around 50 to 90% in neonates less than 6 months around less than 1% in total hemoglobin in adults normally high in, in, uh, in neonates but long term elevation may indicate thalassemia hemoglobin s and uh, is sickle cell and it it's not a topic for discussion today so there are some minor hemoglobin components of a which are a1 1a a1 a2 a1b and a1c now a1c is is the one which we are going to talk on now whenever we try to mod, uh, monitor and depend on hb a1c in any given case in non pregnant state also you also expect some of the vari variations in hb a1c there are still i am not going to go into the standardization of hemoglobin a1c practices which is being many uh, which is being actually taken care by ngsp guidelines and most of the methods which should be followed should be ngsp certified method across across the globe but we are not going to detail of it but there are some ethnic variations it has been found that asians have little higher hb a1c versus caucasians in some of the data so a1c is being formed as a non enzymatic attachment of glucose to the n terminal valine of b chain of hemoglobin life span around 120 days of rbcs and a1c reflects the long term glycemic exposure representing the average glucose concentration around 8 to 12 weeks there is intra individual variations are much less the the coefficient of variation is usually less than 1% so in the person the variations is much less but interpersonal inter inter individual variations are high and we also have the data which said there is a glycation gap and there can be a possibility of some one person having a, 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 a x amount of hemo uh, hb uh, blood glucose and the hb a1c may differ from one person to another even in the by, by taking care of all other confounders and this is called as uh, glycation gap so the, like you have responders and non responders and slow responders to the drug you also have the uh, low or high glycators in the population which may have their implication the clinical practice may not always be in pregnancy so the glycation of n terminal valine residue of hemoglobin gradually occurs as erythropoietes erythrocytes they circulate changing the electrophoretic mobility into the a1c region this post translational post secretory glycation proceeds through a relatively unstable aldenin and the skip base that then slowly undergoes a amadori re uh, re reaction to form a stable and essentially irre irreversible catomin linkage since the erythrocyte gradually lose their ability to metabolize glucose as they age but remain permeable to glucose and that is why intracellular glucose concentration reflects the extracellular plasma glucose in hb1c so this is a diagram where uh, there is a glycation of non enzymatic glycation of hemoglobin less than 5.7 is being acceptable but 5.7 to 6.5 you have pre diabetes and they become high risk more than 6.5 not acceptable now what about hb1c in pregnancy outcomes do we have a data that 
In, in Perry conception, a linear relationship down has been shown of 6.3% has been demonstrated to in, in more recent large study with an absolute increase in the risk of anomaly by around 2% with every 1% increase in HbA1c. HbA1c measured in early pregnancy and those with HbA1c of 5.9 to 6.4 had higher rate of major congenital malformations uh, were, uh, with, with women who have HbA1c versus those who have lower HbA1c. 5.9 is one of the cut point which I cut off which was given. Relative risk of major congenital anomaly was almost 2.6, uh, 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 preeclampsia 2.42 and shoulder dystocia around 2.4 times higher and parenteral 3.96 higher if your HbA1c in the first trimester is more than 5.9. And this is a diagram, you must have seen it earlier. If your mean, uh, if the HbA1c around less than 8, the, the congenital malformation risk is around 5%. More than 10, this is around 25%. So the, the HbA1c, it has been shown that congenital, it has, it has its relation, it has its implication in clinical practice that if your HbA1c is less than 6.5, the risk of having congenital malformation is going to be almost similar to the non-diabetic. Of course, the other figure I told you from the other data is 5.9, but this shows around 6.5, and that's why most of the guidelines are telling you that try to achieve a preconception uh, HbA1c control to less than 6, ideally. 6.5 acceptable, but if you have a high risk of hypoglycemia, especially in type 1 diabetes, then even up to 7 is acceptable. And this is a data which has been published very recently. The association between different HbA1c levels and the adverse uh, outcome, and it, you have a GDM negative women and GDM positive women. Even in this figure, if you see, I, I don't know, okay, this might not uh, accept this pointer. If you see the, the HbA1c around 5 point, say 5.3 or 5.4, or it's around 5.2, the, the figure is going up even in non-diabetics. So they say now even around 5.7, 5.6, you should be a little careful. Now this, this is the first trimester, then second trimester and third trimester HbA1c levels. Women with HbA1c of 6 to 6.4 percent at 26 weeks had increased risk of uh, delivery uh, LGAs as well as uh, which, uh, with an odds ratio of 1.7. Those with 6.5 to 6.9 were at increased risk of having prenatal preterm birth, preeclampsia, and neonatal hypoglycemia. And the risk further increases when the HbA1c goes up. So second trimester, less than 6. First trimester, less than 5.9. That has been documented. Now, what is the impact of HbA1c during pregnancy? And this is a paper, association of HbA1c with, within the normal range and adverse outcome. And they have shown that higher HbA1c within the normal range itself, that means normal is, say, even less than 5.7, is an independent risk factor for preterm delivery and preeclampsia, especially amongst GDM negative women. And that we have shown, we have shown in the earlier, uh, uh, the the earlier one, this is the diagram of that particular paper that you come around 5.2 or 5.1 onwards, say 5.2, even that is risk factor. And now let us talk about the, the changes in normal pregnancy, what happens to hemoglobin, what happens to iron. Now we know that pregnancy is a, is a state of hemolysis and there is increase in the, as the, as the, as the pregnancy advances, I'm sorry, I'm getting, yeah. As the pregnancy, yeah, as the pregnancy advances, you have increase in the blood volume. You have increase in the RBC mass to, to compensate this anemia, which is actually dilutional anemia, and the hematic rate goes down. So you have dilutional anemia with around 15 to 20% increase in the red cell mass, which more erythropoiesis. You have little uh, number, decrease in the number of platelets, but what happens is you have anemia, which is dilutional anemia, which need to be compensated through erythropoiesis. Now what happens is in pregnancy, the plasma volume, the RBC volume, and the HB hemoglobin mass uh, uh, increases. There's marked demand of the extra iron, especially in second half, which cannot be overcome by diet. And thus there will be a physiological iron deficiency. And not only a fall in HBMC concentration, but the hematocrit value in the second trimester, but there is also associated low iron in the body. Now, 
individual with iron deficiency anemia unfortunately the iron deficiency anemia in our population is is very high in pregnancy and that is why we have to be careful of of depending on hba1c reading in patient who have iron deficiency so what happens in iron deficiency to hba1c the iron deficiency incre uh, anemia increases the hba1c the the exact reason may not be known but there is a hypothesis which says that uh, uh, that the, it has been demonstrated that there is increase in the uh, malaldehyde which is actually increases in the subject with iron deficiency which augments the glycation of hemoglobin and that is why you have uh, uh, you have higher hba1c in patient with uh, iron deficiency anemia on an average we monitor blood glucose at around uh, hba1c around every 3 months in in patient who does not have preg uh, pregnancy non pregnant but there is no clear cut guideline that how much hba how much how many times it should be monitored but the consensus and expert opinion says that it should be monitored every month in pregnancies with type 1 and type 2 diabetes most of the uh, studies have reported the relationship between the first trimester hba1c and the risk of spontaneous abortions and congenital malformation which i have shown you the goal of the treatment should be try to achieve hba1c less than 6 and uh, in in gdm uh the, there is no recommendation of using this test for diagnosis of gdm life span in uh, life span of rbc comes to around 90 days instead of 120 days in pregnancy and uh, uh, it, so it it may reflect the blood glucose control of around last few weeks rather than last 3 months and that is why it has been recommended to use it for once a month rather than uh, rather than for 3 to 4 months in pregnancy a1c from non pregnant to pregnancy an important factor influences a1c a1c in iron deficiency which becomes more common during pregnancy iron deficiency may prolong the red cell survival and studies have shown in non pregnant pregnant population that iron deficiency can lead to 1 to 1.5% relative rise in hba1c or an absolutely uh, absolute increase in by around 0.1 to 0.2% now let us see the clinical implication of uh, of the uh, implementation of this hba1c how should we use this now the first to second trimester as i told you uh, will be there will there will be always b low hba1c when you compare in the same women in non pregnant versus pregnant state and in the first trimester as well as as you progress there will be little lower hba1c subsequently in healthy women pregnant had low hba1c particularly in the first trimester this might implicate that the prevention of congenital malformation and macrosomia in type 1 women hba1c should be below 5 in the first trimester and below 6 in the third trimester so you should try to achieve this from this paper which has shown what is normal hba1c for non diabetic pregnancy and this data again says in the non pregnant state uh you have 5.5 to 0.4 in the early pregnancy it comes to 5.1 and the late pregnancy it comes to around 5 so this data again says they should try to be more strict vigilant and more strict control in the early pregnancies in early pregnancy for unrecognized role of hba1c in early pregnancy for unrecognized pre existing diabetes or early gdm we call it as pre gestational diabetes also so the early gdm hba1c of 5.8 to 6% are reported to have high specificity and positive predictive value for de detecting women who is likely to be positive a large observation study has shown women to detect who had diagnosis of diabetes 5.9 can be the cut off in at before 20 weeks and it this threshold has actually has shown almost 98.4% uh, specificity uh, uh, in in the diagnosis so applying hba1c threshold of 6.5 may miss out for almost 47% of these women who have this so we have to be a uh, little uh, on, on lower side we also have data from dr balaji group and we he, he says that hba1c of women with normal glucose tolerance should be around 5.3 to 5, 5.36 uh, and gdm women uh, should in the first trimester should be uh, 5.96 and less so uh, so this is again a figure which matches with the international publications which is between 5 and 6 in later pregnancy can we detect 
the GDM, the, which is going to be positive in future. Now, most women with letter GDM will have HBMC of less than 5.9. Analysis may replace uh, uh, the uh, 24 to 28 weeks OGTT, but at this moment of time, women at letter GDM do not have an elevated L uh, HBMC in the early pregnancy, and we can't rely on it. Women with letter GDM do not have any elevated HBMC in early pregnancy, so you can't do that. What about the post use of HBA1C in the postpartum women for persistent hyperglycemia? So very important is for 6 to 12 weeks postpartum, the phase of hemolysis which happened during pregnancy might have its impact for 6 to 12 weeks till you have newer RBCs. And that is why HBA1C cannot be used for non, the, uh, on the basis of the non-pregnant uh, uh, criteria cutoff values of 5.7 or 6.4, what you have in uh, 6.5 what you have in non-pregnant person. So postpartum, 6 to 12 weeks, the gold standard is oral glucose tolerance test to diagnose diabetes as a postpartum diabetes and not HbA1c. After 12 weeks, of course, you can apply that. Other investigations for diabetes relevance in pregnancy, OGTT is gold standard. CGM may be used, I'm not going to go in detail of it. Fructosamine, urine glucose uh, has no value. Fructosamine, uh, just uh, gives you reading of around two weeks and fetal ultrasonography. Mid-pregnancy fructosamine measurement predictive value for GDM uh, and, and associated, associated postpartum, uh, postpartum glycemic indexes says that the second trimester fructosamine is a poor predictor of G, uh, just glu G, 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 uh, glucose intolerance in pregnancy as well as in postpartum, so we can't use it. Another major is 1,5-anhydroglucetol uh, in, in uh, uh, gestational diabetes. And we have some data uh, which can be used because it may uh, take care of some of the some of the uh, some of the variables which uh, may affect the like like you have uh, iron deficiency anemia or other things which can be taken care of uh, fetal hemoglobin which can be taken care of by another glycation. One five AG levels are lower in pregnant women with GDM compared to individuals without GDM like you have HbA1c. So finally, what is the recommendation of using HbA1c in pregnancy? Due to increased red cell turnover, A1C is slightly lower in the, in the normal pregnant women than in non, uh, normal non-pregnant women. Ideally, the A1C target should be less than 6 if this can be achieved without significant hypoglycemia, but the target may be relaxed up to 7 in view of type 1 diabetes who have a high risk of hypoglycemia. When used in addition to pre and the post meal blood glucose, monitoring, CGM can help to achieve HbA1c target in type 1 diabetes. When used in addition to blood glucose monitoring targeting traditional pre and postprandial targets, real-time CGM can reduce macrosomia, neurotal hypoglycemia. I'm not going to go in detail in type 1 diabetes. CGM matrix may be used, but commonly used, this is important statement, commonly used estimated A1c and glucose management indicator calculators Calculations should not be used. So calculated HbA1c should not be used in pregnancy. In a studies with women without pre-existing diabetes, increased A1c levels within the normal range are associated with adverse outcome, and this has been shown in HAPO. Observation study in pre-existing diabetes and pregnancy shows the lowest rate of adverse A outcomes with the six HbA1c 6 to 6.5 in early pregnancy. A1C represent an integral measure of glucose. It may not fully capture the postprandial spikes, which drives the macrosomia. This is a limitation of HbA1C, and that is why you have to have the, the, the home monitoring of blood glucose along with HbA1C as a, as a target. And thus, though, although A1C may be useful, it should not be used as a secondary measure for, sec, uh, for glycemic control in pregnancy after glucose monitoring. In the second and third trimester, HbA1c less than 6 has the lowest risk of LGA, preterm delivery, preeclampsia. Taking all this into account, less than 6 is optimal control. A1c target in given patients should be achieved without hypoglycemia, which in addition to adverse sequelae may increase the risk of low birth weight. Given the alteration in red blood cell kinetics during pregnancy and physiological changes in glycemic parameters, A1c levels may need to be monitored more frequently, like once in a month, to see the blood sugar control. The final message is A1C in the first trimester and ideally the first pre, uh, prenatal visit should be uh, done if the OGTT is positive. Note the pregnancy specific A1C reference range and monitor more frequently. 
A1C test done as early as possible could identify women at high risk to, uh, for, uh, for, uh, and, and improve the blood glucose control. A1C testing is more convenient but less accurate than OGTT at detecting abnormal glucose tolerance in, for gestational diabetes. And the A1C and fasting cutoff is lower in pregnancy. Finally, wishing you all a happy Wala Raksha Bandhan, Independence Day, Ganesh Ossav, Janmashtmi, stay safe, stay healthy, keep smiling. Thank you very much for your patience listening. <laughs> Always cut the fruit and not the cake to, uh, to celebrate any occasion. This slide I try to keep in all the meetings uh, if possible. Thank you very much for your patience listening.